mighty God. And he's the God that came and he saved us. Hallelujah. He rescued us, church. Oh, our God is so good. He poured his compassion and his love for us. Hallelujah. We just worship and praise you, Lord God, tonight. Everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs compassion. A love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. A kindness of a Savior.
October 1st, 2021, at 6 p.m., we will be having the men's fellowship. Men, invite your friends, invite your boys to come on out and enjoy that time in our men's fellowship. 
Saturday, October 2nd at 12 p.m. is a Harvest Fellowship for the children. Amen. That we will be having it here at 12. Hallelujah. October 3rd. October 3rd is our official two services will start. The first one will be at 8 a.m. Services with no children. Services at the 8 a.m. But the 10 a.m. The children's services will be open and be provided. Amen. This is to provide more space and more options because our Sundays have been full. We've been not only full up here, people have been downstairs. We want to be able to provide that more space and options. And Tuesday, October 5th at 6 p.m., the young adults will start once again. Tuesday. Hallelujah. The young adults are excited. Hallelujah. That's a great time. And right now, we have a great time, even right now. Thank you for all of you that are viewing. Thank you for all of you that are here for your contribution, for your heart, before God, before this body, before this church, working together in one heart, one purpose. To see God move in our body, in this church, in our city, in our state, in New England, that we can reach our world for Jesus Christ. Amen. And it starts by you and I here, and those that are viewing. Hallelujah. We can have our usher right here in front. Amen. Danny, if you can lift up your voice. You are worthy to be praised. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Worship team, Pastor Ed and everybody on the worship team, thank you for being part of prayer. Thank you for um, working hard on Wednesdays and also on Sundays to be able to lead us and usher us into worship. We thank you. And also the sound team and the media team, we thank you. The live stream, we thank you. Everybody is working very diligent on getting better at what God has called them to do. Those of you who volunteer and also those of you who give online and those of you who support this ministry, man, it's a privilege, it's an honor to be able to work together because it's just not one person doing it, this side of the church doing it, but all of our church in one way or another, we are involved in church. I really want to thank you, amen. Let's just give each other... A round of applause. Those of you who are viewing, those givers who give online and they're not able to make it here at this time, you know, they still take it, you know, they still take a, a moment out of their day to send in their tithes to our ministry and send in their offering to our ministry. You know, when God touches your life, it's easy for you to release into the kingdom of God. And when you love God, that makes it that much easier because we could be religious or we can be familiar with church. You know, you know when to stand up, you know when to say praise God, you know when to say hallelujah, you know when you walk around a, a, a pastor or a preacher or a teacher, you get all sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, right? We can do those things, but those things don't benefit you, amen, because God knows our hearts, the Bible says. God would like for us to worship in truth and in spirit. Come on now, church. 
Father, we just thank you for another wonderful evening. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, you are the one who guide us. You are the one who leads us. We, are bear, we bear witness tonight, Holy Spirit. You are the one that searches all things, Holy Spirit. You are the one who sanctifies us, Holy Spirit. We thank you for leading us and guiding us and teaching us tonight. We thank you for your presence. God, in, in all things we do, we will give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone say amen. amen. So I am definitely excited about um, fasting next week. Um, I, I continue to fast, and I'm, I, it's a lifestyle with me, and I'm hoping that, you know, as sons and daughters of God, you partake of that with us next Monday. In the following Monday, we're going to be having prayer from 6 to 8 p.m. every Monday. A praying church is a powerful church. So that's every Monday from 6 to 8 p.m. after next Monday, we will be meeting here at the church laying a hold of God. And I'm also excited about the young adults. Come on, young adults. That was weak young adults. Can I hear a shout, young adults? Come on now. Thank you. You've been asking to get it up and going, and now that we, you know, we have it up and going, man, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And the ministries that are open, so those of you who are viewing, you can bring your children here on Thursday evenings. We have an awesome time. And also October the third, we'll be having our 8 a.m. service. There will be no children's ministries available. You can bring kids here in the sanctuary if you like, but if you rather have them in a ministry, bring them to our 10 o'clock service. Amen. How many of us tonight, you can open up your Bibles to chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I'm not going to um, go there yet. But our response to people determines whether or not they will like us or dislike us. How many of us believe that tonight? How we respond to people will determine whether they like us or dislike us. So if you are rude and obnoxious and disrespectful and you have poor manners towards people, they're going to not like you, and they may even show you the same type of treatment that you are giving them. But if you are kind and respectful and polite and appropriate, they're going to reciprocate that back into your life as well. As Christians, how many of us believe that it's just good to be good to people? And there is no good in us but the Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, the Christ. Say it louder, the Christ. The Christ. Last Thursday, we talked about the authority of God's Word. Amen? How all Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, and instruction in righteousness that you and I will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We talked about the authority of God's Word. Tonight, we're going to look at how our response determines how effective that word will work in our lives. Our response to the word will determine how effective God will work in and through our lives. Charles Swindle said that we cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way towards us. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is control what is in our power to control, which is our attitude. Turn to your neighbor and say, my attitude. Turn to them one more time and say, sometimes it stinks. Come on now. That's real. Charles Swindle said, I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react or respond to what happens. And so it is with you and I. We are in charge of our responses. So our response to the word determines how effective the word will work in my life. You see it right there on the overhead. If you need to, you can write it down tonight. Our response to God's word determines how effective his word will be in our lives. 
One of the things that we do in life is as believers, we read the word, we meditate upon the word, we declare the word, we parrot the word, we speak the word, and we also share the word. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we are obeying the word. This past Sunday, I talked on and, and spoke about stewardship. I, I shared a truth about stewardship, how God owns everything. Turn to your neighbor and say, God owns everything. Now I tell them, I am a steward of what he has put in my hands. How many of us did something differently this past week to show that God is the owner of all things? See, as Christians, we can just talk about the word and I can preach the word and minister the word of God. But how many of us actually put that word into practice during the week? Sometimes we need to realize that our culture, our own ideologies, our family, our tradition, the, the, our view on the world, or even our past can influence our lives more than God's word if we don't submit what we think to his word. Isn't it a strange thing sometimes we believe that we are the creator and not the created? Jesus said to the Pharisees that you make, the God, the, you make God's word of no effect because of your tradition that was handed down to you. And so as believers, we can do the same thing. If we allow our culture, our ideologies and tradition or view about others to be so strong in our lives, it can trump this word right here. Think about how you were taught or what you grew up on or who was influencing you in your life, they can have more influence than this word right here. One of the things I have to realize is that as believers, we should have a biblical world view based on the infallible word of God. God's word is true. There are no discrepancies in the word of God. His word is accurate. His word is pure. His word is life. All those things about the word of God are true, and we must ask ourselves, what is our worldview or our biblical view concerning my life and also the world? A, a biblical worldview is built upon the framework and the ideas and the beliefs through which Christian interprets and interacts with the world. That's a biblical worldview how we see the, uh, our, our physical, our emotional, our intellectual, the spiritual dimension of our lives. Christ must be the focus, the foundation and end for everything in our lives. From Him and through Him and to Him are all things. In layman's terms, God must be the guide for my marriage. God must be the guide for my finances. God must be the guide for my attitude. God must be the guide for, you know, how I interact with people. God must be the guide for my giving. God must be the guide for my heart for souls. I must allow the Word of God to be priority in my life above every other thing on this planet Earth. Can I get an amen? amen. Do you have a biblical worldview or is it tainted by your culture? your environment, your expectations, your family tradition, or your own ideologies. I would like for you tonight to answer these questions quietly with a simple yes or no. Does absolute moral truth exist? Is absolute truth defined in the Bible? Did Jesus live a sinful life? Did Jesus live a sinless life? Is God the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, and does he still rule today? Remember, we are asking these, we're answering these questions with a yes or no within us. Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Is Satan real? Is Jesus real? Is heaven real? Is hell real? 
do we have the responsibility to share our faith with others? Is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Is the Holy Ghost still alive and well today, operating in the lives of believers? If you answered yes to all of these, according to Barnea research, only 9% of born-again believers answered yes. Let me break it down a little bit more for our church here tonight. 10% in this room, according to that research, answered yes. So if there's 100 of us in here, only 10 of us answered yes to all those questions. See, what's more important to your yes to those questions is whether or not your life shows it. Because our gut reaction will reflect what we deep down, honest to goodness, believe to be real and true. Wow, this is a wonderful Thursday night. God is really ministering to our spirits tonight. See, our response to God's word will determine its effect in our lives. Example, if I work for a boss and I'm guy number one, and there's guy number two next to me. And the boss tells us both to take care of the operation of the facility. Guy number one, myself, listens to what the boss says and does everything he asks for me to do. Guy number two decides to goof off and do whatever it is that he wants to do. The boss comes and checks in on us. And the boss sees that guy number one is doing what's asked of him. So he brings guy number one and guy number two back together. And he says to them, okay, I'm going to say this one more time. I would like for you both to take care of the facility. I need you to show up early, and sometimes I might need you to stay late. He added that to the equation. And so guy number one does everything the boss asked for him to do, while guy number two still shows up late, and still leaves early and does not take care of the things he needs to do. We both responded to our boss. How many of us believe with a, rate, a show of hands, believe that guy number one will have his boss's favor? Amen. Guy number one, will, how many believe that guy number two will eventually get fired? Guy number two will eventually get fired because he is not responding to the boss the way the boss is asking for him to respond. He says, I need you to take care of everything. I don't need you to goof off. I don't need you to, you know, come and show up when it's for, you know, you want to show up and do what you want to do. I need for you to do what's right. So our response will determine the favor that God has on our lives. Our response. The word of the Lord tells us that God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So as believers, we are blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am blessed. I am blessed. Tell them one more time, I am blessed. I am blessed. But for that, for that blessing to be enhanced on your life, it's important for us to respond appropriately to the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It reads that the word of God is alive and active or another word for active, is powerful. That word powerful, that Greek word translated into our English word, means energy or energetic. So the Word of God is alive and active or powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So the word in the Greek means that, our English word means that it is energetic, or the word is intense, or the word is vibrant. Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the word of God is vibrant, it's effective, it's active, it's intense, it is spiritual, there is life in the word, so more than... 
born again believers, when we have this word in you, in us, we're going to be active, energetic. There's going to be the life of God in us. There's going to be power in us because the word is living on the inside of us. The Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he said, and we thank God. Now listen to why he said he thanks God. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word. It's like you're sitting here tonight, you're not accepting it as a human word. So the Apostle Paul gave thanks because they received the word. Turn to your neighbor and say, I received the word. They received the word not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Now I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation tonight. It says, therefore, never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Believers tonight, is the word of God working in and through you tonight? Is the word alive in you tonight? Do you allow the word to come into every arena of your life? Or do you allow the word only into a certain area of your life? So when you allow that word to come in, when you allow Christ to come in, his word, do you just keep Christ in your living room? Do you just keep the word in your living room? In a living room is where you have fellowship with people. That's where you invite people over. So in your living room of your heart, do you just allow the word of God to stay there? Meaning that I know the living room in the natural is about, you know, uh, fellowship and having people over. And that's where people can go. Right. So this is where we allow Jesus to go just right in that living room of our heart where I know I need to have a relationship with him through his word. I know I should come to church and have fellowship with believers to learn his word. I know I should pray. Is Jesus, is the word of God just in the living room of your heart? Or do some of us allow that word to go into our bedroom? See, in the bedroom, in the natural realm, is where a lot of relationships take place. Whether you're married or whether you're not married, that's where a lot of relationships take place in the bedroom. Turn to your neighbor and say, in the bedroom. Do we allow the word to take place in the bedroom of our heart? Or do we say, no, God, I don't want you in that area of my life. You could just stay in the living room, God, because I'm not willing to change that arena of my life. Do we allow the word to go down into the basement where we keep all the junk, where we keep all the boxes, where we keep all the storage? You can also say, do I let him go into my attic where I keep all the junk, keep all the storage, keep all the boxes? Because those are the areas of our past. Do we allow God? God to deal with the past failures and issues of our life or do we allow God to bring healing into our life do we say God I want you in my bedroom I want you in my living room I want you in my attic I want you in my basement I want you in every area of my life or do we just say God stay right here in the living room it's some good stuff tell your person that she amen those of you viewing tonight, where do you allow God in every arena of your life or you just allow him into your living room? The word cannot be merely reduced to ink on pages or just a nice story. On the contrary, we must see the word as being active, energetic, and powerful, which has the potential to change every arena of our lives. My wife and I, we decided that we can help everybody, but not everybody wants help. We can help everybody as a church, but not everybody wants help. The word can help everybody, but not everybody wants the word. I love Thursday nights. 
Hallelujah. Don't you love, let's just give the Lord a clap. I love Thursday nights. Those of you who are home, you're missing an anointed time on Thursdays. Our response determines how effective the word of the Lord works in our lives. You know what's amazing? That James, the book of James, chapter 1, verse 21. You can write that verse down or you can read it up there on the um, overhead. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth. Another translation reads, filthiness. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly or meekly accept the word planted in you which is able to save you. So there's two things that James references. He says to get rid of all filthiness or to get rid of all wickedness, another translation reads naughtiness. Because when you refuse to get rid of those things in your heart, it closes your heart and it closes your mind to the beneficial effects of the Word of God. So it's just like a child, a child that is naughty. If a parent asks them to do something, the child might turn his nose up or, or do one of these things and put a pout and look just real ugly and nasty, right? And then some parents, we hit them, and some parents, we just allow them to do those things. That's on you. I know what I did with my kids, the same thing my mom and dad did to me when I was growing up. Come on now. Yes, I got beat. Amen. Hallelujah. And it kept me straight in life. Amen. And one of the things that I've learned is that the, the, the writer, the book of James right here, he says to get rid of all naughtiness, like a little child, when a little child refuses instruction and correction from his mom or dad, or he argues, he goes back and forth. Our children, nowadays, they know they know how to manipulate themselves out of things in life. Come on now. Whether they talk to the mother or whether they talk to the father, they know how to manipulate the mom and the dad. So James says to get rid of all w wickedness, get rid of all filthiness or naughtiness so that you can receive the word which is able to benefit your life. Romans 9.20 declares, but indeed, O oh man, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? How many young men and women today have allowed that spirit of confusion and perverseness to enter into their souls to cause them to talk and walk and act a certain way, a way that God did not create them to act. God made males, say male. Man, say it like you mean it. God made males and God made females. When they get married, they're supposed to unite and reproduce. Listen that Romans just said, who are you, human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me this way? And that's why I believe we need to come against that, per, that, that spirit of perversion and that spirit of, uh, of, of, of confusion that is rampant in our city, our state, our nation. We need to rebuke it. We need to bind it. We need to cast it down. And we need to release the power of God and plead the blood upon the hearts and lives of families in this city. And it also tells you and I in Job 40 verse 2, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. The New Living Translation reads, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but you don't have all the answers. How many of us at one point or another, man, we, we want to criticize God? We want to tell God what to do. We want to do what we want to do, and we want God just to bless us. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it and how we want to do it, and then we're going to say, pastor, preacher, teacher, evangelist, pray over me so God's blessing can be on me. 
We want to do what we want to do in our own homes and have somebody come anoint that home, pray over the home, bless the home, and then when they leave the home, you still act like a, 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 come on now. We want to tell God what to do and how to do it and expect to be blessed by God. The Bible reminds me that if I am willing and I am obedient, I shall eat the good of the land. The Bible tells me in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 up to verse 12 that it says that if I am obedient to God, there's blessings that's going to overtake me. There's blessings that's going to be on my right. There's blessings on my left. There's blessings in front. There's blessings behind. I will be God's favorite. Come on now. You will be God's favorite when you choose to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And so I believe that we're living in a time where there's people who just choose to be rebellious in the name of God, in Christianity, but they really don't want God. But see, I believe that this church is different than a lot of other organizations that are out there because I really believe this church wants God. I believe the people who are here, they are hungry for God. The people who are viewing, they are hungry for God. There are people who show up on Sunday mornings and Thursday evenings. They are tired of being tired. They are tired of church as usual. They are tired of religion. They are tired of tradition. There are people in this church right now. It was so amazing when uh, Sister Iris came up to me the other day. She says, I want to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on now. I want to get filled with the Holy Ghost. That is the power of God. Mike's wife. That's powerful. She didn't say, I want more money. She didn't say, I want a new car. She didn't say, I want a new home. She said, I want to get filled with the Holy Ghost. That stirs my heart. The other day, I was downtown Meriden. There was a gentleman who wanted to meet with me. He said he had a hard time coming to church. He said every time that he would come to church, he relayed a message to somebody. They, re they relayed the message to me. They said every time he comes to church or goes into a building, that he ends up throwing up. And then I said to the person who related to me, say, well, I'm going to go down there and cast the demons out of him because that's what it is. And then she said to me, okay, I'll relate a message. And then I said, does he still want to meet? And then she said, he most certainly does. So I went downtown in Meriden and I met him in, on our green that we have right here. And so he comes over and he has his cane and he's walking. And then I says, praise God, a miracle is going to take place today. I was just excited because anytime I see anybody who is, you know, bedridden, they're not feeling well or they're coughing or they say I got an ache or I have something going on in my life. I'm like, OK, Jesus is showing up through my life. I'm going to cast it out right now in the name of Jesus. Believers in this church. You have the power to cast out demons, to take up serpents, to speak with new tongues, to lay hands on the sick, and nothing poisonous shall harm your body. That's what Mark chapter 16 tells me. Amen. And so he walked over with a limp, but he went home walking straight. Come on now. And that was after I sat there and listened to his story. And as I was listening to his story, I said, that's a demon operating in your life. And that demon needs to come out of you. And then I started speaking to him about God's forgiveness. He was an agnostic. By the time he left there, he was a believer in Christ. You have the power and the ability to change lives. Turn to the person and say, I have the power to change lives. And so I began to minister to him, listen to him. The power of God showed up. He said, I, I haven't been walking, you know, um, the way I need to walk. You know, sometimes I, I put it away and it's just so much pain. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command your ligaments, your tendons, your joints right now to realign themselves. In the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of pain and discomfort right now to be broken over your life. In the name of Jesus. And right now I declare the word of God over you. I speak life. I speak healing, I speak peace, I speak restoration right now in Jesus' name. I say, well, I want you to get up and walk right now. And he says, huh? I say, get up and walk in Jesus' name. The guy stood up like this, taking walk, uh, steps like this, step like this, step like this. I said, come on, let's run. He says, no, nah, I'm not going to go that far. I said, all right. I said, just walk around this table right here right now. I said, give praise to Jesus Christ. He said, thank you, Jesus. He said, thank you, Jesus. I said, I want to invite you out to church, and I'd like to see you on Sunday morning. Amen? 
I said that to say this because I understand who I am in Christ. I could have been moved by what I saw. I could have been moved by the natural realm. I could have been moved by his pain and what he was saying and by his limps. But I was moved, I was compelled by the Spirit of God to say, you know what? God can bring healing to this man. God can deliver this man. I'm going to bring it home with you right now. How many of you tonight, you're moved by what you see? You move by, you know, your financial situation. You move by what's going on in your marriage. You move by what's going on in your life right now. You're moved just like a leaf that's blown in the wind. It goes to the north, then it starts going to the north. It goes to the south, it starts going to the south. But how many of us have learned to stay, stand on that rock, which is Jesus Christ? And you learn to become immovable when you stand on that rock. You learn to become strong when you stand on that rock. You no longer listen to family, friends, and relatives who are God-haters. You start listening to God and become a God-lover instead of a God-hater. So the opposite of filthiness and naughtiness is meekness. Meekness which carries with it the ideas of quietness and humility and sincerity and patience and the openness of the heart and the mind. These characteristics are often associated with the fear of the Lord, which is an attitude of reverence and respect towards God. Meekness. When you read this word, you read it with meekness. Openness. Jesus said to the disciples, unless you be converted as a child, you will not be able to enter into the kingdom of God. Unless you become teachable, unless you who are here today, those of you downstairs, those of you who are viewing, say, word, I need you to teach me today. I need to humble myself before you today, word. Holy Spirit, I need you to reveal this truth to me as I read it. I'm having problems in my mind. I'm having problems in my relationships. I'm having problem, problems in my health. I'm having problems with my children. Holy Spirit, reveal this word to me. I want to humble myself before the word. I want to reverence God. I want to reverence his word. If I could, I, I, I could care less if y'all see me or not on TV, but I want to do this bow down before the Word of God. I want to submit to the Word. I want to submit to what God is saying. Can you still hear me out there? Can they still hear me on, uh, on YouTube? or Can they still hear me? I want to be able to submit to it. I want to be able to be open they can still hear me? Praise God, they can still hear me. I want to be able to be open to the word of the Lord. I want to be able to submit to him. How many of us in our very life, we submit to him? We receive the word of God with meekness. How many of us tonight? So it says right here, the answer to life is Jesus. We can remain calloused, and we can remain stubborn. Is it still going on? Oh, thank you. We can remain calloused, and we can remain stubborn towards the word, or we can, like newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that we may be able to grow. See, God's word can produce quite different effects in people, and these effects are decided by their reactions to those who hear it. There are some who's able to receive the word with meekness, and there are some who do refuse to receive that word with meekness. The word of God is the same. The people who receive the word, they receive it differently. So Hebrews 4.12 declares that not merely is God's word alive, but it's also a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God brings out into the open the inward nature and character of those who hear it and distinguishes sharply between the different type of hearers. 
I said a lot right then and there. So I'm going to break it down for you right now. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So it's foolishness to one group of people, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God to a different group of people. The difference lies in the reaction of those who hear it. The message is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When I was growing up, I heard that Jesus loved me, but I refused to receive that word. But the message that was preached when I was a young kid is the same message that I received when I was 24 years old. Because when I was 24 years old, I said, it's the power of God. I'm ready to receive this word in my life. But it was the same message. Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. Jesus resurrected so that we can be saved. There are some who reject it, and there are some who receives it into their lives. And you could just say that within your own family members today. There's some who will reject you because of Christ, and there's some who will receive you because of Christ. The word is active, is powerful, and is a discerner of the hearts, and is sharper than any two-edged sword. Those who reject it and call it foolishness, and those who receive it, and find it as the saving power of God. Jesus said, and I'm about to wind down, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 38. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. The sword or the word of God that Christ came to send upon the earth is the same one that John saw proceeding out of the mouth of Christ in Revelation. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That same sword goes to the earth, dividing members of families, households, friends, because of the response of each individual. One says, I believe it, while the other one says, I reject it. But as for me and as for my house, we will serve the Lord. Can you turn that off for me, please? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So those of you who choose to receive the word of God, thank you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you are able to hear the word, you're able to produce faith. God's word does not immediately produce faith. When you want to hear the word, when you desire the word, when you want that word to become part of you, you then desire to have the hearing. After the hearing, comes the faith. I'm going to say it one more time. Faith, repeat after me, faith come by hearing. Faith come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Word. One more time. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. God's word does not immediately produce faith. And this is why sometimes we're wondering why we're not developing faith. When you and I desire to hear God's word, when we want his word, when we pray and fast over his word, 
there's something that arouses us on the inside, and then that produces faith. And then faith will come. But if you approach God's word very haphazard, or if you approach it very nonchalant, or if you approach it like, you know, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. If I believe, he will not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, I'm going to go to church and just, if somebody asks me, I'll tell them that I read the Bible today. If we approach it that way, faith will not be developed. But when you come to church and you expect to hear a word from God, when you come to worship and you expect to worship God, when you come to open up your Bibles when you're at home and say, God, speak to me. God, I need you. God, I want your word. God, I'm going to pray over this word right now. Then there's the hearing, and then after the hearing comes the faith. And so that's what he's talking about, and that's why so many times we miss the faith being developed in our lives because of our approach to the Bible. Many times we speak of faith, but when we speak of faith, it's only in a doctor, it's only in medication, it's only in a, uh, uh, or in a politician. True scriptural faith is always directly related to the word of God. So faith only comes through hearing of God's word, and as the, that is the only way that faith is developed within your spirit. Turn to your neighbor and says, I need to want to hear God's word. One more time, I need to want to hear God's word. I'm going to help you tonight. When you hear it, then faith comes. When you desire it, then faith comes. When you want it, then faith comes. When you want the word the same way you want to eat, because there's a lot of hungry people in here, amen? When you want the word, when you get like the same way you get hungry and you just say, no, I want the word, then faith is going to come. David said, and now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant in his house, may it be established forever, do as you have promised, or do as you have said. Luke says in 138, it declares, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered, May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Another translation reads, Let it be done unto me according to your word. Those five short words that David says, Do as you have said. How many of us, when we get before God and we're praying for something, believing God for something, we say, God, do as you have said. How many of us trust his word? The secret to scriptural faith is according to God's word, let it be done unto me. When you receive his word and you get rid of the filthiness and the meekness and the filthiness and the wickedness and the naughtiness and receive it with meekness, you're able to receive that word which is able to save your soul. The same way you're able to be healed by God, you, re you, you receive the peace of God, you receive the love of God, you receive the joy of God. God, may it be done unto me, God, according to your word. Because Hebrews 11:6 declares, without faith, it's impossible to please God. As believers, we need faith. Why? Because anyone who comes to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God's word, when we allow it to become a priority and we seek God with all our heart and we believe he is God, he's going to reward us because we are diligently seeking him. In the natural realm, at one point in time, we all saw a mate in life. Some of us are still seeking a mate in life, but you're diligently looking for one. How about to diligently look for Jesus? How about to diligently look for the Holy Spirit to show up in your life? 
How about to diligently say, God, according to your word, let it be done unto me. You said I can have it in the name of Jesus. I want to thank you for it right now in Jesus' name. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why Peter says, the believer who has been born again by the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, has within them the possibility of lead, leading a life of complete victory over sin. Because when you become born again, you have a new nature on, on the inside of you. You have resurrection life. You have God's power. You became born again. You are his son. You are his daughter. That's an incorruptible seed living on the inside of you. Stop allowing others to corrupt it by what they put in your face and what they put in your ear gate. We allow so many things from social media, family, friends, Facebook to enter into here and into here. And it can come down into our soul, which will cause us to start thinking differently about the person we're with, about church, about God. I said it Sunday, let God be true in every man on this earth a liar. The way you and I respond to God's word will determine how effective it's going to work in our lives. You're going to leave here tonight and you're going to decide to say, I agree with this word and I want this word to come in every arena of my home or I just want this word to stay in the living room. To the degree you agree with God is the degree that you will receive the miracle that you're looking for in life. Faith comes by you wanting to hear God's word. Let's have every head bowed tonight. There are some of you who are here tonight and there are some of you who are viewing and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If this is you tonight and you have been one of those individuals that has rejected the word of the Lord your entire life, I would like to give you an opportunity to know him. The Bible tells me that sin separates us from God, but Jesus came for your sin. It says that if I acknowledge that I am a sinner, and receive his word into my heart, I can receive Christ, who is the Savior of the world. If you're at home tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, and you do not know Jesus, or you're in this sanctuary tonight, and you do not know Jesus, or maybe you have gotten away from Jesus, and you would like to come back home to the family of God, I'd like for you to just lift your hand up and put it right back down, right where you are seated. If you are home tonight, lift your hand up and put it right back down. If you don't know Jesus, if you've gotten away from Jesus, lift your hand up and put it right back down, and we will say a simple prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All over this room tonight. Hallelujah. Those of you who are at home, I'd like for you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean by your precious blood. I believe Jesus died and resurrected for my sins. And I receive his word into my heart right now. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Those of you who said that prayer here and those of you at home, we rejoice with you because the angels of God right now in heaven are rejoicing. So as a family, let's give the Lord a clap for those of them who gave their life to Jesus Christ. We love you. God bless you. And we would like for you to message us so that we can help you understand about the decision that you just made. We look forward to seeing you and your family come and worship with us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. God bless you.
We love you, and good night, those of you who are viewing. I want to thank you for viewing our services today. I am believing God along with you that you are going to put today's truth into practice. Now, if you made a decision to follow Christ, or if you rededicated yourself back to him, please message us so that way we can help you learn more about the decision that you just made. As a church, we look forward to seeing you and your families. Stay blessed and have a wonderful day. Thank you.